Hey, everybody, it's Kathleen Gage with Plant Based Eating for Health podcast show, and I am really excited today. My featured expert is Layla Dehagan. And uh, Layla was actually a doctor and is a doctor, but she turned a plant based nutritionist when she found the power of plant based eating and veganism. And we're going to talk about that today. She's got a wealth of background knowledge, experience. She's very skilled at what she does. So I'm going to give her a chance to introduce herself. And then we're going to go into a conversation about something that's really near and dear to her heart. And I'm finding that I want to help get that message out too. So Layla, great to have you here. Hi, Kathleen. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the nice, uh, lovely introduction. Yes, I, um, I was a doctor for a very long time, but uh, I had to quit for health reasons. And I guess I'm actually, I was quite lucky because then I stumbled uh, onto kind of nutrition, a whole food plant-based nutrition, which kind of saved my life. You know, my, uh, you know, I regained my health, but it also gave me a new direction. So it was really kind of, you know, a lifesaver. And so I'm a nutritionist now. I'm really passionate about nutrition because I think we can do so much with nutrition. You know, it is like almost, I mean, you know how people say exercise is preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. I think exercise plus nutrition is preventive medicine. So I really love actually, you know, talking about uh, nutrition. And, and the amazing thing is we don't really need to turn our lives upside down, you know, our diet upside down actually to achieve results. Right, right, absolutely. But, now, when you were a doctor, what, what, uh, what was your practice about? Uh, I, I wanted to become a pediatrician. So oh, I was a okay. junior pediatrician. Yes, I was really, I love to work with children. And uh, I never know, did I go actually to medicine because I wanted to work with children and those I wanted to help and work with children. So I thought, you know, being a doctor, I can do both. I wasn't into science. It's quite interesting. I was never really into science as a doctor, but now as a nutritionist, I have actually fallen in love with science, you know, how on the, on the micro level our body works and uh, what we can do, you know, it's really amazing. So I'm really actually in a way, you know, I don't like to say it, but it was a blessing in disguise. Absolutely. You know. And I know you got your certificate of completion from E. Cornell University. And interestingly enough, you got your certificate of completion uh, through E. Cornell the year that I went plant-based vegan. And, and it's funny because I didn't originally call myself vegan. I didn't want to be associated with the, the radical veganism movement. And now I proudly call myself a vegan because I realize it's more than uh, what I initially believed about it. And when you turned plant-based did you turn was it plant-based was it vegan was it whole food what was your your process well i actually went vegan for animals and at the time it, i was a, a personal trainer so i wasn't a doctor at the time anymore so and i had no idea about nutrition i mean mm -hmm. i'm sure you know doctors aren't, aren't really taught about nutrition at med school so i didn't really know anything about it and when i went vegan I really thought like a lot of people, I only have to eat salad and vegetables. You know, I had bland vegetables and a lot of peanut butter and jam. So that was, you know, my diet for the first two, three months because I just didn't know what I was doing, you know. And I thought as long as I'm not just having animal products, that's fine. And obviously it wasn't. I mean, now I realize I was actually a junk food vegan. So, and, you know, I read uh, a lot about people saying, oh, when I went vegan, my migraines got better. And I was like, kind of lucky you, nothing happened to my migraines. You know, I still get my migraines, but then, uh, you know, the plant-based health professionals UK, and I'm really proud to be part of them now. I'm an advisory board and the education lead uh, at plant-based health professionals UK. They actually hosted the first nutrition conference in London. And for some reason, I still don't know how it happened that I got, I saw it somewhere, I got an invite. So I signed up, went to the conference and it was just an eye opener, you know, like kind of what people actually cure their cancers with nutrition alone. And I just thought, how is that possible? So I started actually reading about it, you know, attending summits, webinars. And one day I had another migraine, which lasted five days. So I was like in bed for five days. And I just thought, you know, if people can cure their cancers, maybe I can help myself. And I was really desperate at the time. So I really didn't have any life. So I just really changed uh, from a junk food vegan 
like to a whole food plant-based diet. And again, even when I went to a whole, to a whole food plant-based diet, I wasn't like kind of, I didn't look um, at recipes. I was just uh, thinking, okay, as long as I don't have those processed foods, I'll be right. fine. And again, it was amazing reading like kind of, you know, a week, my headaches got better and gradually I saw, oh, actually, I'm not getting any more migraines. And it, it was really amazing. And I was blown away. Well, it is pretty interesting what happens to our body when we do go whole food plant-based. And, and this is a discussion I've had with many people. They assume that if you're vegan, you must be plant-based. And if you're plant-based, you must be vegan. The two can be worlds apart. You can be plant-based and still consume animal-based products. And you can be vegan and eat a lot of junk food. And I know for me, I started because of health. It was uh, to do with inflammation. Within two days, the inflammation was gone. And I didn't realize until I was sitting in the dentist chair about a year into uh, being plant-based, I didn't realize that I used to have almost daily headaches. And I, I was for three hours in the dentist chair, he was doing some bridge work, had my mouth open and I had this just splitting headache. And I thought, wow, I haven't had one of these. How long has it been? And it was like, oh my gosh, when I went whole food plant-based. So let's talk about the distinction between that. And I want to remind people that um, I am talking with Leela Dehagan, and uh, she is a plant-based nutritionist out of the UK. Uh, she is also on the board of plant-based health professionals of the UK. Um, and what is your web address? How do people find you? Well, I have a, a website, uh, just a Dr. Leila D. So my surname just shortened, uh, drleilad.com. Okay. But I'm also on Facebook and, you know, all the usual social media. Okay, uh, excellent. Well, and yeah. we'll make sure to put all that below in the show notes, because I want to make sure that people can reach you. But I mm -hmm. um, want to talk, first of all, about, about the difference between being plant-based, whole food, plant-based, vegan, and then just being a junk food vegan, because there's, there's a big distinction. Yes. I mean, veganism is really a lifestyle. It is just the... Uh, the fact that we are trying not to harm animals. So mm -hmm. we avoid using any animal products whatsoever. And it is not just foods. It's also like kind of, you know, the clothing or entertainment, you know, anything to do with animals, we avoid that. So that means like kind of, you know, sugar or, you know, Oreos because they are like kind of accidentally vegan <laughs> biscuits. So all these are actually vegan because the, there isn't any animal products, but they are high in sugar and you no know, fats and the unhealthy fats. So you can actually be vegan and still eat a lot of junk food, uh, like kind of processed foods, right. but that is not healthy. And I find actually, especially because I'm vegan for animals for you know, ethical reasons. And I think because I want to advocate for animals, I need to be as healthy as possible. I love because that. I want to actually be able to have a life, to do things which I wasn't able to do before, you know, when I was just having a vegan junk food like kind of diet. Right. But also I think, you know, when you are healthy, you actually set a good example for being a healthy vegan. So your own health is actually the best example, you know, when you talk about veganism. So and the whole food plant base, that is when you avoid the processed foods. So and animal products. But you are right, some people who call themselves plant based they try to eat predominantly uh, plant-based, the kind of, but they still have uh, on occasions animal products. Right. I believe whole food plant-based is the healthy one. They're hundred percent like kind of uh, vegan and whole food plant-based, and that is when you avoid all animal products as well as processed foods. Right. And, uh, well, and it's so amazing to me how much I've learned in the short time I've been a plant-based vegan, and it's been two and a half years. And the more I learn, the less I could go back to consuming animal or dairy uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I, I really have um, a visceral response to even the thought of doing that, where it, it hurts my heart. It literally hurts my heart. And energetically, I think we're all connected. Now, I know that you're really involved in a project food and diversity. That's kind of your, your uh, really heartfelt project. Tell us about what food and diversity is, what you're hoping to see happen with that and how people can uh, get involved in that. Yes, it's interesting. It started last year in March when, you know, uh, 
the BLM was happening and everybody was actually kind of talking about racism. And I have always been actually kind of aware of racism because I have seen experienced racism in my own life, you know, while growing up in Austria, Vienna, and even later as a doctor in the UK, I'm not gonna go into the details, but for me, racism, that has always been part of my life. Uh, but it was like a, a separate thing happening. And obviously uh, I am into health. I have always been uh, promoting health. And even as a doctor, actually one of the reasons was I wanted to help people. Uh, so, and I thought, you know, the best thing I can do is actually be a doctor because there are areas in, you know, actually countries and regions in, in, you know, in the world where they don't have access to health. Mm -hmm. And my original plan was, you know, to become a doctor and go to developing countries and work there. And even as a, you know, a doctor, I went to India and worked in a rural hospital for a while, uh, kind of volunteered really. And, uh, and it was just so sad seeing that, you know, they didn't have the simple, simple kind of, you know, things which would have actually avoided uh, complications. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like kind of, you know, I knew about health that, you know, people needed access to health. And then later when I became aware of nutrition and the role of nutrition, and I was like, kind of, yes, but do, does everybody have actually access to healthy foods? Not really. And it is not just in you know, developing countries, even here in the UK, even here in London. It is amazing how many people are actually kind of, you know, they don't have access. And you know, it is the same in the US because of the food desert. So mm -hmm. it's just almost like kind of, you know, as um, some people say, it is by design that certain populations, they don't have access to healthy foods. So if you don't have access to healthy foods, obviously you are going to be, become sick more often than other people. And then if for some reason you don't have access to healthcare, and we know that marginalized people, you know, uh, all these like kind of, you know, in the UK, we call them BAME, like black, Asian and uh, minority ethnic populations. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same access to healthcare for var various reasons, you know, and obviously racism plays a role as well. So for me, you know, it was like kind of, I was aware of all these little things happening, but I never realized actually they are connected. So like, and that is, you know, in March, I, when, every, when people was talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter and then COVID-19 was happening. And we saw that, you know, actually the um, minorities, like uh, communities, they're actually more affected. And they're not just talking about like kind of the general public, even healthcare professionals from those backgrounds, they were actually more affected by COVID-19. So the death rate has actually was higher. And so I realized actually it is not just the socioeconomic, you know, mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. There's more to it. And that is when, you know, I, was uh, I started thinking and I thought, okay, how can I reach those populations? How can I actually do, uh, reach those commun uh, communities? And obviously I believe in a plant-based diet. I believe that we can achieve a lot by adopting a plant-based diet. And then when I started talking to other people, I realized, uh, people from those backgrounds, a lot of them, I mean, I'm from Iran myself, when I speak to Iranians, a lot of them, they say, veganism, that's a white thing. It's not my pr kind of problem. Or they say, actually, I have so many other issues, real problems, you know, that is for people who don't have any struggles in life. Interesting. Um, and in a way, I understand where they are coming from. You know, if somebody has two jobs and they are struggling actually to put food on their, you know, on the table, and to feed their kids, they don't have time to actually worry about, you know, whether the food is healthy, whether, you know, how, you know, they're just too busy. They're right. Really struggling. So I do understand where they're coming from. And well, and it, it, yeah, and it's so interesting because you really, you, you touched on so much there. There's a lot to unwrap um, about uh, the food deserts. And I know in the U.S., and I'm sure it's like this in the U.K. too, in certain areas of our country, and, and there's real divides, line divides, where you can say, okay, this is a low-income area, and fast food restaurants tend to be there quite a bit. And you have liquor stores, you have uh, uh I, I can't think of the name of the small shops that are independently owned, but it's easier to get a six pack of beer and a pack of cigarettes than it is to actually get fresh fruit. And so it, it's so interesting because I think as we start stripping away at a lot of what's been going on and how we've been conditioned to eat a certain way, to believe a certain uh, belief around communities of people that, you know, people are where they're at because they want to be there, which is not true. It's because 
because there's so much money that is pumped into uh, certain um, ad campaigns. I mean, I, I am finding the more that I learn about all of this, the more shocked I am at what uh, our government has done. And I know it's happened in other uh, parts of the world, but um, it, it's, I tend to believe that if we could really get to the core of people's health issues and help them to be healthier, we wouldn't have as many medical problems. We wouldn't have as many financial problems because I know that when somebody eats a balanced plant-based whole food diet, that they tend to have better thinking. They're more focused. They have more energy. Um, and so it's a huge, huge, huge undertaking for any of us to try to even put a dent in what's happening. Um, and with your food and diversity program, what specifically are the initiatives of your program and, and um, what are you hoping to accomplish with that? Well, I was actually quite lucky because uh, after I did my master's in nutrition, I got a job in, in the community. Mm -hmm. So I got to work actually, it was like a, it's a free service where people in the community could join that service for free. Uh, so it was actually, you know, the government was paying for that. And uh, so and I could actually talk to real people, to be honest, <laughs> like kind of, you know, what they think of nutrition and how they perceive, you know, what a healthy diet is. And because it was a free uh, service, obviously it was uh, more for people who couldn't afford mm -hmm. actually kind of like hiring a personal trainer or seeing a nutritionist because we were like kind of offering, we were delivering webinars, workshops, and even exercise classes. And what I saw is that, as you were saying, a lot of these people, first of all, they do want to learn. It is amazing how willing they are actually to learn about a, you know, the, a proper nutrition diet, but it is on us to actually to give them the information in a form, in a way that they understand it and they can take it in. And one of the things, for example, I wasn't happy in the community with was that they would overload them with information. And, uh, you, and I had obviously to follow the, uh, the guidelines and I would talk about all of that for an hour. And then I would ask them, so can you just give me, just give me one example of what I told you now? And they couldn't remember a thing. Right. So I realized actually, you know, we are not approaching it properly. We really need to educate them really, I don't know, bite sizes, like kind of, you know, in a way that they can take it in and we need to adjust it to their level. And it was interesting, like a lot of people didn't even know that beans and chickpeas and lentils are actually source of protein. They really thought it is red meat. Right. And again, they thought, you know, chicken is healthier than red meat. Everybody would come to me and say like, oh, I'm not having red meat anymore, but of course I have chicken. Like kind of, you know, right. I'm eating healthy, I have chicken. And, and when they say that, you want to say, oh, but, but, and, and it's meeting them where they're at, you know, from what I'm hearing you say with these, when you overloaded them with information, you were, you were giving them way too much for where they were at. And I, I know that um, I have a Facebook group with about 1500 people in it. And the, the number one frustration I hear from people who have gone plant-based vegan is that their family members are not on board, that either they're making fun of them, they're pushing back, they're bringing in uh, unhealthy foods into the, the home. And they say, what can I do? How do I get them to change? And it's like, you can't force somebody to change. But what several people have said is that you have to meet them where they're at and you have to hit them from the perspective of what's important to them. For you, when you started, the animals were important. And for me, it's so amazing because I've done animal rescue for years. I've worked in the pet industry in the United States for years, and yet I was still consuming animals. And when I had that, that aha moment, it was like, wow, that was so out of alignment. So People come into this lifestyle, and I do call it a lifestyle because once you really immerse yourself into it, it's, I don't know that anybody who really commits to being vegan for the animals could ever go back. And, and if they do, I don't know that they were really 100% vegan. So um, when you are working with people uh, with your nutrition, um, and somebody is 100% committed, they're making the changes, but their family members are not. How do you coach them on that? Well, I must say, first of all, in the community, for example, the people I was seeing, none of them wanted to go vegan or plant-based. Mm. And because it was a community-led you know, organization, and I never actually kind of um, hit the fact that I was a vegan. 
I, I was always very open and honest about it because that is what I believe. So none of them wanted to go vegan, but I would tell them, look, I'm vegan, but then I would meet them where they are. And you are right, actually family members can be a huge obstacle. And it doesn't even have to be like kind of people wanting to go vegan. Even if these people just want to change their diet and eat a healthy diet, that can be a problem. And like, for example, I had a lady who, uh, you know, it was interesting when I asked her, what do you eat? It was just like, you know, what the leftovers of whatever the kids couldn't eat anymore. And obviously kids, we're talking about teenagers, like kind mm-hmm. of, you know, and they wanted to have burgers, chips. So she was having all those unhealthy foods and just because the rest of the family wanted that. And she didn't know how to approach them and tell them, you know, change, you know. And, but then I think it is really just about changing your diet first. Once you have adapted that and your diet is healthy and they see that, see the changes in you, then they will actually come on board. And it is difficult because uh, there will always be temptations, like family members coming on, say, oh, but that is your favorite cake. Again, I have seen all of that. And I was just thinking, but you you know, your husband wants you to lose weight. <laughs> Why is he doing that? <laughs> so, I, and I think, again, what I always tell them, don't try to make your family eat a healthier diet or go vegan or whatever, you know, your, wherever you are and whatever you want to achieve. Just lead by example exactly and i think the main challenge is actually to resist them when they say oh here's your favorite cake and it is just a piece of cake you know it is somebody's birthday why not and uh, yeah i think it is just uh, but then that is when you need to know your why Why i i i I love that because um, I I actually have been sober for 37 years. And I remember early on when I quit drinking, I, and I had a real problem with drinking. I, I'm an alcoholic and I'm sober and 37 years sober. And and I was uh, completely different than I am now. I, I was a blackout drinker. Uh, I was rude to people. I was uh, it just not a, not a nice person. And there were a lot of people who said, you need to stop drinking. Well, when I stopped drinking, those very same people were like, oh, just have one. And it's like, you don't get it. It's like, for me, one is not going to work. And it's, I've seen the same thing in uh, people who are making lifestyle choices that the, the husband or the wife can say, well, I really want you to lose weight for your health, you know, may it, not even for the physical side of it, but just for your heart, for your diabetes, for whatever it may be. The person starts losing weight, starts getting in shape, starts feeling better about themselves. And the other person may be threatened by it. So I think there's a lot of dynamics that go into the whole process of, first of all, us choosing to make the lifestyle change, but then other people. And I love what you said is lead by example. And in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, they say attraction rather than promotion. So live the life and people will be attracted to it. So again, how do people get in touch with you? Go ahead and give us your web address again. Yes, my website is www.drleilad.com. Okay, and if you could spell that out, so people that are just listening to this. D-R-L-E-I-L-A-D.com. Okay, excellent, excellent. You. So, um, then, you know, you said something about change, and I think uh, change is threatening because when you change, when somebody who's close to you changes, it is a threat to your identity. And I think, again, going back to my uh, food and diversity project, one of the things I have seen with people is when they grow up with eating a lot of meat and they believe that is part of their culture, they really feel that, you know, when you come and tell them, go vegan, eat plant based, they feel actually you are attacking their culture, the traditions. Yes. And I think that is why it is so important that uh, we have people from the same background showing them that first of all, there is nothing wrong, you know, with eating plant-based that can still be part of your culture and that you can actually veganize your foods, your favorite foods, you know, the foods you grew up with, you know, the foods your grandma made you and you can still have all of them but you also really need to see people from your own background doing that. Right. And uh, one of the things I did initially with my project was, you know, I'm going to actually interview vegan athletes of color. And I did that last year. And the videos are going to be released actually in March, hopefully. So because I thought, you know, if people uh, uh, admire athletes, because athletes actually do the impossible, they, they achieve the impossible. So I thought if they see actually people of color, you know, from their own background, 
achieving something impossible and doing that on a plant-based diet. So they're actually having a good life, a successful life, but they are vegan. Right, so if right. they see that, they, they are more inspired to give it a go. I love that. And then I realized cooking is so important. Right. Because uh, first of all, I think a lot of us, we have forgotten how to cook and cooking is an art. Again, that is something some cultures, they actually, you know, they, uh, one of my friends, actually, she is uh, from Indian background, but she, you know, her family was in South Africa. And she said, whenever they cook, the whole family would gather in the kitchen. So it is like really a family <laughs> kind of occasion, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I learned to cook when I went plant-based because I never really liked to cook. Uh, from the past, I, I got criticized for my cooking. When I was in eighth grade, my home economic teacher didn't like me. And so no matter what I did, it was not good enough. So I just built up this wall around cooking and, and domestic things. I just didn't want to do it. Well, when I discovered plant-based eating and I started experimenting, I love to cook now because, yeah. and really what I feel that it is, is it's, I'm energetically putting a lot of love into the food that I create and to have people enjoy it and knowing how healthy it is. I'm yeah. sure it annoys them though, when they're eating and I go, can you feel the health in your body? Can you feel, just feel that? <laughs> so Right. I, I actually started cooking after I went whole food plant days as well. And I just think, again, going back to the fact that, you know, when you have a job and you come home late at night and you know your kids are hungry, you don't have the energy to start cooking. And right. then you have this shop very close by, which offers, I don't know, burgers and chips for two, three pounds. Of course, you're going to go and buy that. So, and I think it is again on us to actually show people how easy cooking can be, how easy and cheap. Absolutely. And well, and that's the thing. Food. Yeah, it is really quite inexpensive if you know how to do it. Like I do big crock pots of uh, soups and stews and, um, and, and I just, in the morning, I get it ready by afternoon. It's, it's ready to consume and I'll have it for a few days. My mother-in-law loves it. So it works really well. Now, where do you see yourself over the next year or two with the projects that you're working on? What's your vision of what you would like to see happen in the plant-based vegan movement? I really hope that, you know, the plant-based movement becomes a little bit more inclusive. I think it is sad that, you know, if you go on Instagram and you kind of search for veganism, you only see all these white bloggers and uh, mm -hmm. influencers, mm -hmm. and that puts people off. And, you know, people, we, we call them people of color, but if you think, you know, outside of the US and the UK, the majority of the, you know, world population is actually pe people of color. Right. And that's why, you know, I like the new term, uh, which has been coined people of global majority. You know, we have Asia, we have South America, we have Africa. Actually, the, these are huge populations. And, you know, a lot of times I see on um, social media people saying, oh yes, uh, I don't know, the meat consumption has reduced, uh, like kind of dropped in the UK. But what about China? The middle class is growing and they're actually consuming more meat. So we cannot just focus on where we live. We really need to think globally and find a way actually to talk to those people. I, I so agree with you. I so agree with you. And, and I really um, encourage people to at least explore this way of life, at least explore different recipes. There's plenty of great books out there. And um, also look at what it could do should you contract the virus? Because I know that they always have those examples of people that were super athletes that got the virus and they died. But the majority of people that are having complications, those are people that have unhealthy diets. They're, uh, they've got underlying complications, comorbidity, and the way you eat can have a huge impact on this, the life that you live. So in closing, what are your final thoughts for people? Um, are there any books you can recommend? What would you encourage people to do to start moving in this direction? I think, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There are so many good organizations out there who are doing great job. So I think, and I really urge people to go and get their information from credible sources. You know, I hate it when people go and ask other people on, in Facebook groups, you know, I have this problem, what should I do? And people start giving advice and right. they don't have the right qualifications. I mean, here in the UK, we have the Vegan Society, we have the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. And I know in the US, there's, you know, 
Dr. Barnard, PCRM, there are so many different organizations and they have great actually material fact sheets. They have, uh, you know, different vegan challenges, 21 day challenge, you know, and like the plant-based health professionals UK, we have the 21 day plant-based health challenge. Mm -hmm. So there are so many different resources free. All of that is free actually. And I urge people to go and get the information from those resources, from those websites, because that is accurate. You know, they can trust them and, and it helps them to make the transition slowly on their own pace. You know, nobody's forcing them because like you said in the beginning, a lot of people, as soon as they hear like kind of the word veganism, they think, oh God, these are fanatics. I don't want to be associated with them. Right. And I think we need to change that narrative. We need to really make it a bit more friendlier. And uh, so I hope that, you know, we can achieve that to actually uh, to talk to non-vegans in a non-threatening, non-judgmental way. And Absolutely. In a compassionate way, because veganism is about compassion. So we really need to bring that out. <laughs> and show I love it that. It, you know, it is about compassion. And I, I sense that the animals sense me differently and they treat me differently since I've chosen to. And the animals have always loved me. I mean, that was not an issue, but just on a much deeper spiritual level. I think being vegan is a very spiritual thing to do. It's a very loving thing to do. And I know things are changing. We met through Katrina Fox's organization, uh, International Vegan Women's Network, uh, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal networking uh, group for women who are in the vegan movement on whatever level. We have solopreneurs, we have uh, stay-at-home moms, we have people that work for corporations. And so a lot is changing. And I think this is going to be the decade of the vegan. I really believe that so much has changed. And I, I think that uh, we're at a point that we can't ignore it anymore. And I have to say, I'm personally very excited about in the US, the change of administration, because we're going to go back to policies that are about the environment and factory farming and things of that nature. So I, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. This has been delightful. And I encourage people to visit your website. Again, we'll put all that information below your social media handles. And if you want to find out more about food and diversity, reach out and find out more. So thank you so much. It's been thank delightful. You for me. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your commitment to an ethical life through plant-based food choices the kind of choices that are kind to your body, the environment, and most of all, animals. Be sure to leave a review and rating of the Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show.